You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to the cabin for another episode of Let's Talk Creation Live, where Paul and I are in the same room, so (laughs) that's fun. That's fun. Uh, We don't get to do that very often, so we like to take advantage when we can. Um, So today we're going to do another Q&A episode. For your listening pleasure, um, this one's just you know we 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 save up these questions thinking we're gonna do you know a special episode on on viewer questions and then we get this we get these pages and pages of things because you guys are so smart and have such interesting questions. Thank you, thank you, and if you have more questions, do remember you can email them podcast at corsi.org. You can follow us on most of the social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and whatever's left of Twitter. And um, let's see, you can also uh, interact. I think you can interact with us on our website. There's a contact form there, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, keep sending in interesting questions. Some of them we'll probably answer right back to you, and some of them we'll probably just sit on and think about future episodes. So we're going to try to knock through a bunch of of uh, questions this time. Last time, I think we got some really juicy ones that took forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to try to do some simpler ones this time so we can get more of them crammed into one episode. So here we go. Um, and this will be the same as we did last time. We'll just, you know, read the question and and whoever wants to tackle yep. it and we'll just Sounds do that. All right, so here we go. I have the book. So this goes back, way back to uh, arguments creationists shouldn't use. I think that episode. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have the book where they mention the dead shark that looks like a dinosaur. Mm. You might remember that's a carcass that was trawled up uh, off the coast of New Zealand in 1977, I want to say. That's right. Yeah, and it made the headlines because it looked vaguely like a plesiosaur. Yeah, um, which is not a di- which is not which a dinosaur, is not a dinosaur, by the way. By the way. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah. just so you know, um, is is everything in this book questionable? Um, I guess my first reaction is uh, we should be questioning everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything should be questioned. Everything should be questionable. You should be able to question sacred cows and everything. Um, and if you're listening to us thinking that we're going to give you uh, the the right answer, you should be questioning what we say just as much as you question everything. So, um, yes, be more skeptical. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um do you? I know there were several creation books that had that in there. Yeah, there there have been lots of creation books with that carcass in it, and lots of non-creationist books as well. Actually, that yeah, that's it. true. So, yeah. so I'm not quite sure exactly which book is being talked about here, but um, and it doesn't mean, of course, that everything in the book is necessarily you know incorrect, um, because that one thing sure. is sure. Um, yeah, so. Are there any other books? Yeah, are there that's, other books? That's probably the, the more important question. Now, it's my book that came out in, in 2021, Fossils and the Flood, mm-hmm. is all about the fossil record. Um, gives a kind of creationist perspective on dinosaurs. And I think I've got a section there on marine reptiles and like plesiosaurs and things okay. like that. Um, but it's not specifically covering yeah. the same ground as, yeah. as, as this. Um, we happen to know that one of our uh, colleagues mm-hmm. um, and, and an erstwhile um, guest on our podcast, Dr. Right. Dr. Matt McLean, yep. who is a dinosaur expert, is working on a book all about dinosaurs from a creation perspective. And I've read um, at least an initial draft of that book, and I can't wait for it to come out. I'm not sure when it's going to be released. I think there's quite a lot of work to do on it yeah. um, in terms of you know, getting all of the figures and illustrations and stuff done. But that will be a book to look out for. 
uh, if you're looking for a creation book on dinosaurs. Yeah, if you're looking for a kid's book, I tend to be far more, uh, what do you call it, um, permissible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had some terrible kid's books. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew out of it. So, you know, kids kids are resilient. And uh, it's, it's remarkable. I had evolutionary um, dinosaur books. Yeah. And that didn't make that much of an impression on me. So... Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. I think, same same, same for smart. me. I, you know, I, I grew up reading evolutionary books mm-hmm. about dinosaurs, and I also read some creation books about dinosaurs that probably now I'd look back on and think, well, you know, that's not right. Right. You know, this sure. is a bit, you know, this has been superseded or sure. outdated. Sure. Um, uh, but they were fun, you know, at the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we do need good resources for, for young people and for yeah. children and that that's yeah. a gap you know so much of you know what we're involved in is at the, that sort of scholarly level correct um and there is a need to communicate what's being done at the scholarly level in a, a helpful way to yeah. the younger age groups yeah there is a there is a gap um definitely and the scholars are often not the ones to actually write those books because they don't know how to write Correct. For young people or for children or whatever. Correct. Or even sometimes just for the regular lay people. Um, you, you, need, you need someone who's very skilled at communication <coughs> who can then take what the scholars are doing and, and rework it. Correct. So, yes. Yeah. I, I often find myself making things for the general public that mm. they have no <laughs> clue what I'm talking about. And I thought, well, I thought I brought it down so you could yeah. understand. I did not. Yeah. All right. Well, here's another question for us then. This one should be relatively easy, and I think it illustrates a, a common conundrum that we find mm-hmm. often in creations. Uh, here's the here's the question. I think this was a comment on one of the one of our videos. Um, I'm not saying that the ice age didn't happen, but wouldn't you think it would be mentioned in the Bible? The whole mm-hmm. earth covered in ice, with continents covered in sheets of ice, and no biblical mention. It seems like it would be a perfect event to describe in Genesis. Okay, so what do you think about that, Paul? Well, I think, yeah, there there are lots of things to say. Um, (laughs) One is that we have to be careful about the scope of the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. It wasn't covering the whole world. Right. Um, It didn't even cover all of the continents of the Northern Hemisphere. Right. Um, So there were plenty of places still left on Earth that were not covered by ice. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's the first thing. Um, I think the other thing to say is that when we look at the Bible's account of the early history of the world, it is very abbreviated. It's very kind of telescoped down. Correct. So it covers a long period of time in a very few short chapters. Right. So it is very, very selective about what it's telling us um, and what it's focusing on. That's another thing to say. Yeah. And of course, the focus of the Bible primarily is the redemptive storyline. So it's it's going to be focused on those key sort of events in redemption history of things like creation and fall and the flood when the world was sort of remade, reshaped. You know, those big redemptive... Um, or judgment type sort of mm-hmm. passages, they're going to have the focus. So the Ice Age is a bit of a footnote, really, when it comes to that redemptive storyline. Right. Um, so those are a couple of things. And then I think, is it true that the Bible doesn't have anything to say that might have a bearing on this? Um, I think mm. the Bible gives us a big picture, for one thing. It gives us a kind of big overarching storyline that actually helps us to make sense of the Ice Age. Uh, The fact that there was a worldwide flood that we think added heat to the oceans provides you with the the requirements that that are needed to get an Ice Age going. So you you need warm ocean because you have to have lots of evaporation from the oceans to pump moisture into the atmosphere. And then as the earth cools down after the flood, 
um, that moisture, which is falling as very heavy precipitation, begins to fall across much of the mid to high latitudes as snow mm -hmm. and rapidly builds up into, into ice sheets. So we have a kind of a framework within the Bible that helps us to explain the Ice Age. And I think there are some clues about climate that might have a bearing on this. So uh, there's the account in Genesis of Abraham and Lot, mm -hmm. and they're looking over the that uh, area of yeah. the you know the, the the ancient Near East, and yeah. it's described as this well watered plain. Right. Not a description. Which it is not. <laughs> not a description that would immediately leap to mind now. Right. And I, ju I just wonder whether there's a clue there that something strange is happening to climate right. in those that patriarchal period. Right. There's something strange going on. And of course, some creationists have also pointed to the book of Job and said, you know, you have all these references to people living in hole holes and caves among the rocks, and we have. Uh, mentions of snow and ice and hail and frost, uh, perhaps more than in other biblical books, Job being one of those early post-flood patriarchs living in that period. Right. So are there clues at least that something strange is happening to climate at the time these these uh, patriarchs are living? Maybe. So Maybe, yeah. 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 I, that That's basically what I would say. Um, and... and, and I think this is symptomatic in the sense that oftentimes we come to the Bible with these big expectations that this is what it should look like, and it mm -hmm. doesn't, and we become disillusioned, and we think, oh, okay, well, maybe the Bible's got it wrong on this or something like that. And it's, it's best to give, <laughs> give everything the benefit of the doubt. Um, because oftentimes our conceptions of what the Bible is trying to say or what we ought to see if this were true are quite mistaken, right? right. And so there's a notion, and, and I can understand why you would think the Ice Age is, is, you know, ice covering the entire planet, but that's just, that's never been what the Ice Age actually is. And so that, is is simply a, a thing you clear up by saying, well, that's that's really not the model of the Ice Age. That's not what the Ice Age is trying to do. We only think it covers the whole Earth because we're Europeans and we think Europe is everything. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't. So yeah. keep yeah. that in mind. All right. Well, that was that was good. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, here's another one. Can anyone explain why Ken Ham insists on including dinosaurs on the Ark? Yes, yes, I can. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. So if you're a, if you think that the world is only thousands of years old, and you think that dinosaurs are created as beasts of the earth, beasts of the field, uh, during creation week, um, then the command to take two of every kind that breathes air onto the ark must include the dinosaurs. Yeah, I mean that's just that's just as simple as that. Um, now it would be, I think, personally, much easier to explain dinosaur extinction if we could say that Noah never took the dinosaurs on the ark. But I don't know how that fits with what the Bible says about two of every kind. So that's where it comes from. It makes quite a bit of sense to me. Um, and it is my operating understanding of, of, of what the dinosaurs were doing during the flood. Lots of them were dead and being buried, and some of them were on the ark with Noah and somehow just didn't, didn't yeah. reestablish themselves after the flood, yeah. however that. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think that's the logic of it. Yeah. Um, the, on the only way I think you can sort of escape that logic is by saying, well, the dinosaurs had already become extinct before the flood happened. Okay, that's so, a possibility so, too. Yeah. No, it didn't mm -hmm. take them on board the ark. But then you've got the problem that we actually have evidence of live dinosaurs in flood rocks. Correct, dinosaur so, footprints. Right. Dinosaur footprints. So, so how do you get away from that? So they were alive. They were alive. The flood. So I think if they were air breathing land animals, they had to be included in that yeah. to go on the ark. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just, yeah. And it's not just a thing of Noah going to get them. It was God brought the animals to Noah yeah. to put on the ark. So 
So there's no way to escape this notion that the land animals, two of every kind of land animal, came to the Ark to get on the Ark. Mm-hmm. And so if that's the framework that you accept, then then dinosaurs must have been on the Ark with Noah and family. Yeah. Now, if your question is bigger than that, why doesn't Ken Ham just say that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? That's a, that's a whole other ball of wax about young age mm-hmm. creationism and why we think creation is recent in mm-hmm. six days and how geology works. And mm-hmm. that's a bigger can of worms. But, yeah. but the simple logic of how, how you get dinosaurs on the ark, that's how you do it. Yeah. All right. So here's one about the podcast. Could you please maybe name out the books and resources you're showing so that a podcast listener such as me gets the names and such directly from listening? Um, we can try to be more conscientious about that. Um, I know that not all of our audience watches on YouTube. Some of you listen. Uh, yeah. Some of you listen during your work commutes and other sorts of things like that. So you can't, um, you can't see what we're doing. I, I, we should try, I suppose, yeah. to be more. But I think we often do. We try to. It's, we might miss. It it's not very yet. helpful when we hold a book up and say it's in this book, but we don't right. actually say what the book is. Right. So that's probably what we probably the, need to the, be more. Yeah, we need to just it. be careful that we don't do that. I, I think we try not to do that. I think we do. And the other thing is, of course, um, we try to put all of the resources that we mention in the episodes into our show notes yes which are available on the website yes so you can go to our website let's talk creation.org and there are show notes for every episode so if there's a book that we refer to um it should be there in the show notes correct yes all of that should yeah anything that we mention in the podcast episode even if it's unfriendly to our position we try to uh include those papers and books and resources in the in the show notes so you can look them up and uh check us out and be careful consumers of what you hear or see all right here's another one (laughs) this is good they never answered the question did humans actually walk with dinosaurs um i think that's back to the the episode where we talked about the footprint uh arguments and the The footprints yeah yeah and um, did humans ever walk with dinosaurs? Did yeah. we did we answer that in that episode? It's been a while I, since I yeah since I'm, we recorded I'm trying to remember whether we did. I thought we had. I but, thought we but had. May, maybe maybe we didn't. So did humans walk with dinosaurs? I think what we're saying in that episode is that um, the Paluxy River footprints are not good evidence that humans walked alongside dinosaurs. Right. Uh, for the reasons that we for the reasons we elaborated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but as young age creationists, we do we do think that humans and dinosaurs were contemporaneous; that they lived at the same, same time. time. Yeah, maybe not in the same places. So, right, you know, may, maybe and this goes back to this whole idea that we've talked about before of the ecological zonation kind of model yeah. of the pre-flood mm-hmm. world, mm-hmm. Uh, and Harold Clark's idea originally in 1946 was these were kind of elevational provinces that things were living at different elevations. Right. Today, we tend to think more um, in terms of biogeographical provinces rather than sort of elevational provinces. So things may be living on different continents or microcontinents before the flood. And I think it's likely the dinosaurs were on a different continent than the humans because we, we have their fossils in different layers of rock um right and yeah. we have to explain that yeah and yeah. so this stratigraphic separation of fossils i think implies that things are living in different places and therefore getting buried you know at different times during, during the year of the flood um but were humans and dinosaurs living at the same time um yes i think that's the logical yeah. implications of the creation account we have the creation of all things in six days uh, the dinosaurs Parts of those beasts, yeah, yeah that's they, day, they're they, day six creation. They were day six creation, yeah. um, and uh, humans are on day six, so that they're created at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, they're living together, presumably in that pre-flood world, right. um, until the time of the flood, um, when uh, the, the dinosaurs you know, are buried during the flood, and then some of them preserved on the ark, as we've just said. Presumably they become extinct quite soon after the flood because we don't find fossils of dinosaurs in post-flood rocks 
Right. Um, so humans, for most of that post-flood period, humans have not been contemporaneous with dinosaurs because the dinosaurs became extinct. But before the flood, yeah. they, they were. Right. So um, a thing I hear a lot is creationists think that the Flintstones is a documentary. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I see that comment yeah. snidely left on a lot of uh, yeah. videos. And um, so if that if that were the case, if mm -hmm. the Flintstones were a documentary and dinosaurs and people were living together, then I think it becomes really hard to imagine how you don't have human skeletons mm -hmm. and other trace remains preserved mm -hmm. with the dinosaurs. Because you have yeah. a lot of really fine and beautiful preservation of dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, and if people were living there with them, like the Flintstones, then I would mm -hmm. expect there to be a lot of people yeah. buried in the same rock. And we don't have that. So I think that's another reason why I would think, yeah, they must be somewhere else. Yeah. The people must be somewhere else. And it would be very uncommon for them to be walking with, yeah, like physically next to a dinosaur yeah. to leave those kinds of tracks. Yeah. Um. And so Flintstones is not a documentary. <laughs> this is why Flintstones is not right. a documentary. Now you know. There we are. The more you know. All right. Um, another question. This goes back to our Behemoth and Leviathan ah. episode. Could it be that Behemoth is part of the same Baraman as a sauropod dinosaur, but looked very different because of post-flood speciation? Mm. So I think... The questioner here is 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 asking us to speculate about okay maybe you can't maybe you can't figure out which dinosaur known dinosaur it might have been but could it have been something that developed after the flood that Job right. saw or Job was aware of that was a sauropod dinosaur right and I guess my answer is sure why not I I I don't. What did what what is the behemoth referring to? That's sort of the big question, right? Yeah. And I think the answer is we don't know for sure what that is supposed to be. Um, it seems like an actual animal that is big and fearsome and amazing, but which animal it is, uh, I don't think there's really enough detail there. Mm -hmm. For us to, to sort of pin down exactly what it was. I know a lot of people think it's sauropods and mm -hmm. you know, Brachiosaurus or whatever. Uh, sure. Um, but I don't think it's a slam dunk. I don't, like I said in that episode, I don't think we should be going around telling people there's dinosaurs in the Bible because of right. Job 40 and 41, I think. Right. That, that's a little more that I'm comfortable with. Anything to add to that? Well, I think it's interesting because. As part of the creation model, we do think that the animals that came off the ark diversified into sure. modern species sure. and varieties. So a lot of the modern animals that we have, their ancestors looked a bit different, the ancestors on the ark. So take horses, for example. You know, the, the horse on the ark was probably not what we think of as <laughs> right. the modern horse. Right. Uh, it was probably this little... Thing with Little four thing. toes, yes, and yes, weird looking, small thing. and browsing teeth and not grazing teeth, and you know, so they looked a bit different. So could the same be true of dinosaurs? Could the dinosaurs have come off the art and diversified? Yes, in principle, that is perfectly possible. Yeah. My only reason for sort of not going down that route, I think, with regard to Behemoth, is um, well, twofold perhaps, but one is that. It looks as if, and we've said this before, that dinosaurs became extinct quite quickly after the flood. Mm -hmm. Be or, or at least they weren't present in any large numbers because we don't find their fossil bones in post-flood rocks. Right. So it looks as if they just didn't really re-establish themselves. So was there really time in the post-flood world for lots of diversification and new varieties to kind of we don't see that we we see it in the horses you know we have we, we sure. see diversification of horses mm -hmm. in the post-flood record we don't see anything like that for for any dinosaur um sauropods or any other type of right. dinosaur so that that's one thing the other thing is you get variation and diversification um but very often you know you can put you can put these things together you know that 
there are lions and tigers and cheetahs and pumas and domestic cats, but they all look like cats. Cats. Yeah. So same with sauropods. You know, we get lots of variety of sauropods in the fossil record, but they're basically recognisable as sauropods, and they have those sort of sauropod traits. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we gave some reasons, I think, in that discussion about behemoth why we didn't think necessarily a sauropod was the best fit. For example, there's no description in Job of the animal having a long neck, right? Which is one of the obvious traits kind of, of one a, of the really yeah, a sauropod. something that sticks out. Mm -hmm. And I literally, <laughs> I would have thought that sauropods, if if they diversified after the flood, that they're, they're still going to basically be these big, bulky, long, well, big. I mean, sauropods varied a lot in size, but they're going to be these sort of bulky, long-necked, long-tailed kinds of animals. Um, even though you get lots of variations on a theme. Um, for various reasons, we thought that didn't that wasn't necessarily the best fit for the description right. of the right. animal. So I'm a bit hesitant about that yeah. as an explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well that's that's good. All right, now I got a now I got a juicy <laughs> question here. This will take a little bit of time. Um uh, why can't the absence of bioturbation be used to determine flood oh, wow. rock. Okay, so bioturbation. Let's see if we can explain what this question means. So when you look into the rock record and you see, for example, a rock where you have animal burrows or you have other evidence of, of, of living things messing around with the sediments, um, that's bioturbation. Yeah. Could it, would bioturbation also include footprints, or is that sort of a different category altogether? Uh, yes. Uh, where you have heavily trampled surfaces okay. um, mm -hmm. by dinosaurs, for example, sure. they even call that sometimes dinoturbation. Dinoturbation. Yeah. Ooh. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So that's the idea. And I think the idea makes... On the surface, it sounds really good, doesn't it? Because you think, okay, well, you have a flood and everything's drowned. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing left there to make this disturbance in the sediments. Or it's the rate of sedimentation. Yeah, or it's the rate. You know, yes, you, you, the sediments you just have are sediments building, up are building up so fast that even if there are burrowing animals there, they don't have time to kind of get to work right. and churn up the sediment. <laughs> Right. Um, in, in a flood scenario. Um, and we have to understand that in, in the modern oceans, if you go and look at the modern shallow oceans, they are teeming with animals that bioturbate the sediments. Clams and shrimps and sea urchins yes. and worms. Yes. You know, and they get to work really fast. Yes. So when, when you have a fresh layer of sediment deposited, in the shallow oceans, that layer is very quickly colonized by shallow marine invertebrates. Yep. And they dig into the sediment, process it for food, build homes, you know, they make burrows for themselves. And those animals are really, really effective at just destroying any structure right. in that sediment, any layering or right. cross bedding or whatever it is, they will just churn it up. So it takes special conditions. Not for, to for that not get, to happen. To get the layers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, if, if we went by what happens in modern oceans, we would expect every layer of sediment in the fossil record to be just thoroughly churned up mm -hmm. by animals because those layers are being laid down sporadically. There's time for animals to come in and to biotubate. But in the flood, when the sediments are building up very fast, we'd expect that there wouldn't be sufficient time in many cases, for animals to come in and buy a And they do it really fast. You know, we, you, you get these animals in the modern world, and within an hour, they can completely churn up the sediment to a depth of several centimetres. Wow. You know, I, they're, they're fast. Wow. Um, so... What's, okay, so, so can we use that to determine the flood rock, right? If you yeah. have... If you have uh, you know, uh, three thousand feet of of yeah. whatever Cretaceous sandstone yeah. that has no bioturbation in it. Can we say, oh, that must that must be the flood? Yeah, is that a thing we can do? Well, that's really interesting because um, 
Leonard Brand and Art Chadwick, mm-hmm. and Art's been a guest on the podcast, right. um, and their colleagues, they have been doing a systematic survey of biotubation in uh, sediments on the Colorado Plateau. Okay. So the Colorado Plateau is a place where you have a nice cross-section through the geological succession. Um, the rocks are well exposed. And so they've literally been going layer by layer through yeah. hundreds and hundreds and oh, hundreds of yeah. feet of sediments. It would be miles of sediment uh, yeah, at the uh, end, I uh, mean, by the time you got through it all. They've been doing, yeah, an yeah. incredible survey and literally looking at each layer and um, quantifying, because there are kind of scales you can use to quantify these things. So quantifying the amount of biotubation in each of those layers. And what they're finding is that overall, the intensity of biotubation is really low. Mo- most of those layers uh, are either not biotubated at all, or they're not biotubated enough to significantly disturb sedimentary structures. Okay. You get occasional horizons where you have a greater level of intensity of biotubation. Interesting. Where maybe there was a bit of a pause and some animals came in and got to work. And as I say, they can work fast, you know, in mm-hmm. an hour, they can, they can do their work. So, um, so they're finding these occasional levels where you get higher levels of biotubation, but enormous thicknesses of sediments where the levels of biotubation are very low. And sedimentologists are very grateful for this because it's by studying the structures in sediments that sedimentologists can work out how the sediments were deposited. Mm, yeah. So, you know, it would make the life of a sedimentologist much harder if if, <laughs> if all layers were biotubated that way. So their argument is that um, what we're seeing there is evidence of very rapid accumulation of thicknesses of sediment. There wasn't enough time for the burrowers to come in and do their job because that's the norm. That's what happens in the modern world. Right. But there seems to be a disconnect between what we see in the modern world and what we see in the rock record. Now, the question is, can we then use that as this criterion, if you like, to distinguish between rocks that are deposited very quickly during the flood and rocks which are deposited perhaps a bit more slowly after the flood? Right. And as far as I know at the moment, I don't know that we have enough data. At least the data I've seen from... Leonard Brand and Art Chadwick's work, they've looked through um, rocks from the Cambrian, which is somewhere down near the yeah. sort of beginning, beginning of the flood, of the flood yeah. up to the Eocene, which is quite early in the post-flood period, right. if we're right about right. where the flood right, right, is. Right, right. Uh, so, could be still flood. For, so it could be yeah. still flood. Um, but they've gone up into the Eocene. Now, I haven't seen any of their data that takes us beyond the Eocene, okay. further into the Cenozoic. Okay. And I think if we're wanting to say maybe the Cenozoic is post-flood and there might be a change, I think we need to see data in the Cenozoic, more of the Cenozoic. Um, also, I guess there's the question that even during that early period of the post-flood um, epoch, so you know the first sort of few hundred years after the flood, things are probably still happening pretty fast. So sedimentation rates still might be quite high. So will there be that much of a difference until you start to get into more modern rates? I I, I don't know. So I think in order to answer answer the question, it's a very, very good question. I think we need more data. It's quite interesting, yeah. It is interesting. But I do think there's also the the, the question of what do you do with bioturbation in the flood itself, right? Right. So you can say the general trend is a lack of bioturbation. Yeah. But when you say that, the the conventional scientists, the evolutionary scientists, will say, "Well, oh, oh, here's this thing, and it's really an obvious surface. Yeah. Like here's here's a place where you have a bunch of dinosaur nests, right? Right. So clearly, this mm-hmm. is not a flood. It's not a flood thing, right? And yeah, and I think those sorts can, of special you, things do need. You can point to sedimentary layers that have got loads of biotubation. You sure. can point to them that where they've been completely homogenized by, yep. by burrows. Yep. Um, but of course, you know, what Brandon Chadwick have done right. is they've been systematic about exactly. it. Exactly. They said, what is the general, right. you know, what, what do we see? But yes, we do see these occasional horizons where you get higher levels. Mm-hmm. But then you've got lots of sediments where you don't nothing. see the amounts of biotubation that you would expect. 
So mm. that that that's interesting. It is. And and then you like you say you've got those other things which are kind of where you've got stationary surfaces and maybe nests. Or, yeah, there's sort of these spectacular things yeah. that people hear about and think, well, yeah. I'll explain that. Yeah, and yeah. one that had me scratching my head a while was. Uh, there, there were claims that in the Morrison Formation, which is is a Jurassic formation out in the west, okay, uh, dinosaur famous for its dinosaurs, mm-hmm. its um, dinosaur national, national monument national is, monument. is mm-hmm. Morrison Formation. There were claims that there were fossilized termite nests, large termite nests in the Morrison Formation. Well, that's going to take a time. That's going to take some time to produce. Uh, and so you know, you kind of think, wow, um, okay, <laughs> uh, what we're we going to do with that one? <laughs> Um, Ariel Roth and uh, some others went and had a look at these um, termite nests and took some samples and looked at them under the microscope in the laboratory and various things, published a paper about it in the conventional literature, and they argued that these things are actually not termite nests. They've been misinterpreted. Uh, They argued that they're inorganic concretions. So these are post-depositional features. Oh, and okay. not termite nests at all. So I, I only mention that to say that when we hear these claims about things that are going to take time in the fossil record, we need to check the claim out first. Um, you know, is there actually something that we need to explain <laughs> that yeah, is going to take true. time? That's true. You know, can we just take the claim at face value? And I think as creationists, we've got lots of hard work to do. We need to go out and check these things out first. And say, well, you know, are they really termite nests? And it yeah. turns out, I think, in this case, that they're probably they're not, not termite nests. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think that's a really important lesson that we try to emphasize. I know I emphasized it on the last <laughs> edition of Question and Answer that we did. Uh, don't take our word for it, people. Mm-hmm. Just, just mm-hmm. you know, you can you can check these things out. You can look up the you can look up the papers we provide and the books that we provide in the show notes and and sort of think critically. About what we tell you, that's a good thing to do. Okay, happy with that answer. I think, I think so. That's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, here's a question for you. Does and this one, this one's outside of both of our expertise. So we're just gonna do some hand waving and move on. Does the young Earth creation model completely forbid new stars forming? Since the original creation, no, I don't. I would have to say no, because it certainly doesn't forbid the formation of new people, or new individual animals, or new individual anything really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess it would come down to your your idea of how plausible it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, the star formation models. How do you, how yeah. do you think those are, are? Do you think those are good? Do you think those explain things? Um, yeah, I, that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, and this obviously is not an area either of us are very familiar with. Um, right. I, I don't I don't know much about star formation models, but I understand that stars form by the collapse of gas clouds. Basically, that's the story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they. So formed by the collapse of these um, clouds uh, that gravitation takes over and then they become dense enough that the elements basically begin to, you know, that there begins to be fusion going on in the um, core of these stars and they basically ignite, they become stars. So that's the story. I, I, I don't know much about it. I don't know. Um, uh, is, is that a process that could happen naturally? I guess if it's plausible, if it, yeah, and we had millions of years to make it happen, yeah, how quickly could it happen? I don't know. I don't know how long. It, I, don't know. I don't know how long it takes. I think that's a we're, little. We're clueless about astronomy, <laughs> <laughs> but I would think theologically, I don't think there's anything no. repugnant about the idea. No, if you can, if you can, if, if we can make things and we can make new, yeah, we can make babies, right? So why couldn't there be new stars forming? if there were time and the right circumstances and the model worked. Yeah. I don't think that's theologically offensive. Mm. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says he made the stars also. Yeah. There you go. Um, just like he made that first generation of people. animals and people. Yeah. And, yeah. 
Um, but does that mean that, you know, like you say, you can't have more generations of stuff? I don't know. Okay. Um, another one from the same listener. Um, I hope you. I hope you're still listening or watching because yeah, you have a lot of really good questions. So yeah, why not? Um, do you agree with mainstream science on the future development of the universe, barring end time scenarios or supernatural intervention? Do you believe the future of the universe will unfold in the same way that mainstream astronomers do? And I would say I have absolutely no opinion on that matter whatsoever. <laughs> um, As a biologist, yeah. it's well past mm. my my area of expertise, uh, well outside of my area of interest. And mm. as a, a believer, I, I just can't bar the end time activities. So mm. I think the end times will be quite significant. So mm. speculating on what might happen if, that didn't happen and the universe just played out as it does i mm. just have no idea no idea no and i don't know to what extent <laughs> scenarios about the future of the universe uh are tied up with models of origins and what's happening i think there are just so many unknowns in cosmology yeah i remember some years ago going to uh, a lecture that a conventional cosmologist gave mm -hmm. and he went through the kind of cosmological model the origin of the universe and, and this kind of thing and, and at the end of the talk he said you'll have noticed that all of the open questions are all of the big questions yeah and <laughs> we're still you know right all of this stuff we don't understand and we don't know and if I come back and give this lecture in five years' time, ten years' time, it's probably going to look really different. Yeah. Um, and, and it just made me aware, you know, how much we don't know about 99.99% <laughs> of the universe. Right. Um, and, and we particularly don't know very much about it because it's not our field. It's <laughs> right, not right, our right, yeah. So. We should probably be very circumspect what we say about it. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think thinking through, you know, what creationists have, have produced in this area, I think there's a lot of really basic physics questions. I think, I think creationists sometimes get stuck on, we have to solve the starlight problem, right? Mm. How, does, how is it that we see things farther away than 6,000 light years, uh, if the Earth is only 6,000 years old? And... Um, that's a really interesting question and a good question, but there's also these all of these other mm -hmm. age indicators and all of these other um, significant issues that we could be addressing as well in yeah. astronomy, yeah. like star formation. Um, I just don't see that many, and I and I'm I'm speaking out of ignorance a lot here because I don't really follow creation astronomy all that closely. I'm following, and I guess. That might be some of my observation bias, that mm -hmm. the stuff that attracts my attention is the big starlight question mm -hmm. stuff. But I don't recall a lot of stuff about planetary formation or right. star formation or anything like that. And I think this raises a broader point, which I think is very important. So often as creationists, what we do is we, we do troubleshooting. We say, here's this big problem for the creation model of starlight and time. And so we focus a lot of energy on that. But actually, I think we ought to be thinking in terms of developing broader models. Yeah. Because I suspect that some of the solutions to some of those specific gonna issues right are going to fall that. out of, yep. the, of the creation model yep. building. Yep. Um, by, by just focusing on sort of atomistically on particular yes, I have problems. To solve this question. I've got to just come up with something that give, gives me an answer in a debate online with a, <laughs> yes. an evolutionist oh, about that goodness. particular problem. And actually what happens is you sometimes end up giving different solutions for different problems that actually don't cohere even with one another. Right. So you, you end up with, you know, <laughs> your, your, the answers that you give in particular situations don't really cohere together. Yeah. And I think we need to be thinking more yeah. holistically about the model. Yeah, we need, we need to be warier than that. Yeah, I get that. I get those questions. I, don't, I wouldn't say all the time, but they're frequent enough that I, it's a genre in and of itself. I'm in a debate with an atheist on Facebook and I need to yeah, know this I'm answer. Saying. And I and I just feel like I'm not gonna 
give you any yeah. satisfaction because yeah. that question's really complicated and hard and you're not going to win your Facebook debate. Yeah. Sorry, don't Facebook debate. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and I think a good example, I was thinking about this as you were going through that, a good example, I think, of the, of the solutions to problems that you never expected was the tidal problem, right? Mm -hmm. What causes the tides to happen? Mm -hmm. And if you're, uh, you know, if you're well educated in the modern educational system, you know it's the moon's gravity. But if you are a medieval thinker or an early modern scientist, you really don't know. And it wasn't until Newton provided this model of gravity where mm -hmm. it's not just the <clears throat> Earth that has gravity, but the moon has gravity also, mm -hmm. that people realized that's why the tides yeah. happen and why they synchronize with phases of the moon yeah. oh and suddenly that light came on and it was not a thing that newton was trying to explain right he exactly. was not thinking i gotta explain yeah. i gotta explain tides i gotta figure this out he was just yeah. working on planetary motion why are there elliptical orbits and he came up with yeah. you know it's because of gravity and then tide the tidal problem was solved as yeah. a kind of an accident. And I think that's, that's the kind of thinking that I think is really quite powerful. Because yeah. then you realize, oh, if I think of the problem in this way, then this odd solution that I wasn't even thinking about just yeah. presents itself. That's right. It's very mm -hmm. cool. Here's another one from the same uh, listener, audience member. Um, other than the Earth, solar system, or nearby objects, could almost all the universe be actually billions of years old or more. All right, let me jump in on this one. Uh, <laughs> this one's, a, this one's a, oh goodness, this is one of those touchy questions, right? Because I wanna say, as a young age creationist, God made the stars during creation week, as mm -hmm. the Bible says. And I understand that the level of detail there is pretty abysmal. Mm -hmm. And he made the stars. You get yeah. that. You, he doesn't even name the sun and the moon. It's the greater light and the lesser light. Mm -hmm. And he made the stars also. And that's, there you go. There's your mm -hmm. celestial bodies. Um, so there's not a lot to go on. Not like biology where you get all these different groups named mm -hmm. and it takes the multiple days to get it all put in order. Mm. With, with stars there's very little but it's still there he made the stars and it sounds like he made the stars during creation week mm. so I would say yeah it is it is the, in some absolute sense of age the universe is as old as the earth mm -hmm. and it is old young Having said that, um, so I would disagree with, with, say, Hugh Ross or old age creationists who would argue that, no, there's really good evidence that the Earth is really old or the cosmos is really old. Mm -hmm. And so we have to accommodate that into our mm -hmm. thinking. But there's also this thing called relativity. Yeah. Which absolutely yeah. throws a monkey wrench into everything. Yeah. And it's so... Mind, because it's mind-blowing. <laughs> it is mind-blowing. Yeah. So the, the, the concept of relativity, which I think is really interesting, is that different, uh, different time is not a constant everywhere in the universe, I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah. But there are places in the universe where time is, is moving at a different pace than other places in the universe. We have observed this, in case you're wondering, yes, atomic clocks in different, uh, different elevations are off just very slightly. So we've been able to confirm, as far as we are able to see uh, and observe directly here on Earth, yes, this seems to be true. Yeah. Um, gravity is one of the things that can affect um, yeah. the flow of time. So is it possible then that, <laughs> and this is one of those things that creationists have proposed, is it possible then that, that the universe really is 6,000 years old, but only from one particular vantage point in the universe mm -hmm. and then if you were at a different vantage point say out in the andromeda galaxy mm -hmm. that it could be billions of years old mm -hmm. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I don't know how to answer that. No. Theologically, hmm. I suppose it's possible. It seems like it's almost special pleading at some point. Where you're saying, well, God's only talking about the earth, so it's only 6,000 years Mm -hmm. here on the earth. And who knows what it is out there. That just seems like special pleading. But then if you have an actual model that goes with it that says this is how it works and this is is how it happens, that strikes me as more compelling and more interesting. Yeah. So in effect, the the Genesis creation account is kind of earth standard time. Yeah, if you will. And... You know, while six days are passing on Earth, equivalent of billions knows, of years where the yeah. processes might be happening, yeah, fourteen billion light years away or something, yeah. something like that. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it is a kind of mind-boggling concept. And then you've also got to add into that this whole idea of look-back time. That as you okay. look out into the universe, you're looking further back into time. So I don't know how you put all this together, but oh yeah, that's are, right. When we when we look at distant galaxies, are we seeing are we seeing them as they are now, or are we seeing them actually in the process of forming during creation week? Are we seeing the process of creation because we're looking back because that light has taken time to reach us? It makes my head hurt. It does. So I'm, I'm glad I'm not a physicist. You know, <laughs> well, this is probably it. why I'm not a physicist. Because I, <laughs> it makes my head hurt. The, the, right. the, the number of possibilities becomes yeah. just gigantic. And so right. then you just, you sort of, I just sort of throw my hands up and say, let's go back to fossils or, <laughs> or biomolecules or something that's more comfortable. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a tough question. Yeah. But I would say sort of the, the, the simplest thing would be to say, okay, well, the Bible doesn't really give us a lot of detail on the origin of, of astronomical bodies. It only gives us specifics about the Earth. And maybe you might even say it doesn't really give us a specific date on the origin of the planet, the rock that's orbiting the sun. It only tells us about the origin of living things that's 6,000 years old. So who knows how old the planet is? So those that a model would argue that the real creation of the universe and the planet yeah. is in Genesis 1-1 yeah. and that there is sometime mm-hmm. later, whatever that means, mm-hmm. that you have the creation ordering yeah. of the of the life forms. And this is a bit different to the, to the old gap theory type yes, idea, which we have talked about previously. Yes. This model is sometimes referred to as the young biosphere Right. Model. Right. So the creation of life on the Earth is recent, but the actual physical matter of the Earth... Yes, is very The ancient. physical matter of the universe might, might be ancient. Um, now, that's not, that's not my view. I wouldn't I wouldn't see it that way. Um, but I know there are other creationists who I regard... Highly. Know, ...as yeah. young age creationists of some form or another, yeah. who I regard very highly, who do hold to that yeah. view... Um, I think it has... See, one of the reasons I'm a young age creationist is because of the theological problems of having the creation of life billions of years ago Mm -hmm. and therefore death on the earth for millions of years before Adam is even created. Yes, yes. Um, And that's a big theological issue for me. Right. Um, Whether the earth is old assuming that life is created on the earth recently, that doesn't have the same theological problems. It doesn't entail, I think, some of those really deep theological issues to do with sin and death that standard old earth models have. So I find myself being a bit more relaxed about it, but it's not my view. I think I think right. the whole cosmos is. Yeah. I think I think it would be more problematic if one of us were a physicist, right? Yeah. Thinking about these questions, yeah. we would probably have a lot more. Right. A lot more to say about this. Yeah. Um, but because I am not an astronomer or a physicist, yeah, I'm left thinking I can get along with people who don't necessarily think the cosmos. Yeah, is young as long as they're putting you know the the fossil record and the yeah and and the life on Earth as a yeah. thousands of years old there. Yeah. Um, For me, that's where the real sort of theological yeah. rubber hits the road. Yeah. I think it's it's there. 
Um, the, I mean, the, one of the reasons I don't hold to the young biosphere view is because I think it looks to me as if the creation of the cosmos is part of the six days of creation. It which, sure does. You know, yeah. Day four. Yeah. I, I'm There's not, a whole day devoted yeah, to it. I'm not convinced about the idea that this is just the appearance of objects yeah. that already previously mm, created. That's... I, I think there's Hebrew that, as I understand it, there's Hebrew that would convey that idea, but it's not what's actually said in the text. It's, yeah. So yeah. I so I have some issues. And just with that. just thinking, not even worrying about the, the the grammar or the Hebrew language itself, but just thinking about the context of the entire mm-hmm. creation week, we affirm the days are all things being made on those days. Mm-hmm. And then I want to say, oh, except that day. When he right. made the sun, moon, and stars, that that that's yeah. something he already did, and yeah. it's just they just appeared. Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking that seems oddly ad hoc. Yeah, um, and it doesn't yeah. really work for me. But uh, like you say, as long as we're talking about the flood or or you know, evolution or living things and such, we get along just fine. And I'm not a physicist, so I don't have to. <laughs> I don't have to, <laughs> don't to trouble myself too much about those those topics. Yeah. But I would also, so I would disagree with that, but mildly. I would more vigorously disagree with the people who would say there is no age of the Earth implied in the text whatsoever. Right. The people who would say we can be, we can accept millions of years of Earth history, mm-hmm. humans on the planet for tens of thousands of years. The fossil record is as old as it appears to be, yeah. and it is, it is um, prior to human appearance. Right. The the classic old age creationist perspective, yeah. however you want to organize it yeah. as a gap theory or a day age theory, yeah. I would say those that model I think is quite wrong, and I would have a hard time getting along with those people in a working sense, right? Yeah. To work with them on on questions. I have multiple. Yeah. Problems, theological, <laughs> scientific, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. with with that view, yes, yeah. all the way around. That yeah. becomes far more problematic, yeah. and yeah. and and it would leave me with far more conflict. Which is really strange because I think there's a perception out there, and I come across this all the time, that what really matters is our belief in creation and the age question. When God created doesn't really matter. It's the fact that God created. That's yes, what I agree that a lot. Yep. And actually, for me, I think the really deep theological issues I have kick in with the age question. That's where so many of those theological yeah. questions become, for me, yeah. so problematic. Yeah. So I kind of tend to think it's actually the other way around. Yeah. Uh, not, not that that God crea- created doesn't matter, but right. what, what I mean is that I, I can't just... I can't in terms just, of thinking of what is important and what is not yeah, important. I just can't say that the age question is not important. It's not important. No, it does no, strike me as no. quite critically yeah. important. That yeah. fossil record, it's got to be something. And and I think we have good scientific reasons to think yeah. it's a flood-caused mm-hmm. event. And I think we have good theological reasons mm-hmm. to think it it's, must be a, the, a, a flood-caused mm-hmm. event. So, so, yeah, or at least a post-fall, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. so yeah so that, that that's a hard one but that darn relativity leaves you with going <laughs> leaves you thinking well I, if that does that does make it weird because you can have because time doesn't have an absolute reference mm-hmm. anymore and if time doesn't right. have an absolute reference then what does it mean that the earth is only six thousand yeah. years old and life is on it is only six thousand yeah. years old you suddenly have to get really really specific about what you're talking about and i find this this is this is the troubling part about it that, that bothers me. It's it's a concept that's absent from the Bible itself, right? right? It's something that we have to come in later and say, oh, well, the Bible really is talking about this and not that because of science. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not real comfortable doing that. That strikes mm-hmm. me as sort of a, a special pleading maneuver, right? Yeah. The sort of the maneuver where yeah. you say, oh, the day is just line up with the geological periods if you don't look too closely. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> if you but, squint. Yes, if you squint just right, take your glasses <laughs> off and, and don't don't look too closely. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't really fit. And so this sort of thing where we're playing with frames of reference and time dilation or whatever it is, I think, okay, that's not what the author here is thinking about. But 
Time dilation is a, a real thing. It's a real thing, it's and it's a real, real possibility. Thing. And you yeah. really do have to think about the frame yeah. of reference that you're talking about. And so then yeah. I think, all right, well, maybe, maybe. I just, I'm just sort of ambivalent. And then I think it really sort of then lands in the lap of the, the theoretical physicist to show mm -hmm. the model that, mm -hmm. that makes that work, right? Mm -hmm. That makes it work that the Earth is only thousands of years old and that the rest of the universe can be, can be as old as it appears mm -hmm. to be. Even though they were both created six yeah. days, only thousands of years ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I think we're all still waiting for that. I, mm -hmm. I keep, you know, I sort of randomly keep tabs on that field. Because, again, it's not my field. But mm -hmm. I check in from time to time. Mm -hmm. You guys figured that out yet? No, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's, th there's not been a, a clear yeah. and universally acclaimed solution to uh the relativity question and then the cosmogony question the origin of the universe question um that all creationists have jumped on board with there seems to have been an increasing focus on time dilation type solutions yes, yes. as opposed to other types of solutions right right but there doesn't seem to be any consensus over um, a particular which model, model. It is. yeah um and I can't understand the pain yeah, pieces, so I don't. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Way above my pay grade. <laughs> it's going way over my head. All right. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of another question and answer episode. Thank you so much for your questions. Do, do please check us out on our social media platforms or uh, podcast at courtside.org. We'd love to hear back from you. If you have any other clarification, clarification questions from today's episode, yeah, share those, and we will maybe we'll sit down again sometime, mm -hmm. Lord willing, um, when we're together again. You know, I need to go over to your house sometime. So. That'd be good. <laughs> I would really enjoy that. <laughs> um, but we'll see how that goes. So thanks for listening, and we'll uh, see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes and all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.